Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Steven Universe Revisit. Today's episode is Season 1, Episode 23, Monster Buddies. Uh, I am Trans Panda, currently fronting Olive, and this is Alex. Hello everyone. Alright, today's episode focuses on Steven uh, forming a relationship with a monster gem monster that we've seen before. We start the episode in a mountain where they're fighting a, is a little hard, but it is a crystalline creature which looks like a heads with arms and legs as it goes out. They beat him, but the cavern that they're fighting in in the mountain starts collapsing in on itself. So Garnet, in a last moment, uh, bubbles Steven and teleports him back to the uh, temple room. Uh, it is the burning room, if I am not mistaken, Alex? Yes, it's heavily implied to be Garnet's room. Yes, this is the room that we have seen earlier in the past episode. Uh, was episodes, but regardless, uh, Steven, in unbubbling himself from the, the bubble, lands on the bubble of the centipede, the monster that we saw in the first episode of the series. In the process, he accidentally uh, unbubbles it, and as the gem rolls out, it comes back to light, and it forms into, I am going to call it a chihuahua-sized version of the centipede. Is that a fair assessment, Alex? Sure. Yes. It's very tiny and scared and constantly quivering, much like a chihuahua, but not in rage, out of fear, <laughs> unlike the mighty chihuahua. <laughs> but yes, Steven notices how terrified it is, and being his usual empathetic self, tries to reach out for it, and he is happy to see that it seems to respond to his respond to his interactions and his attempts to be peaceful and calm as its main uh, lessons and isn't stuck up so much. But before he can go all the way, the crystal gems come back from the mountain and immediately attack it, frightening it even more. Steven, being the ever optimist, uh, says that they should stop beating it and they should uh, try to, I suppose, train it. I believe was their words. Uh, yeah. Yes, train it uh, similar to a pet. Rehabilitate. Indeed. Uh, they seem hesitant at first until Garnet, like, says, I can't say no to a face like that, and agrees to it, much to Pearl's dismay. Uh, yes. It's clear from the way the Crystal Gems are behaving that they are purposefully withholding information from Stephen. Mm-hmm. Indeed, they aren't clarifying as much as they could, and Pearl doesn't seem to want to talk about it. I am unsure how aware Amethyst is, but she most likely is. No, she's aware. All right, good to know. Uh, but they chain Centipedal to a rock on the beach, and the Crystal Gems leave after Amethyst does a lovely Rod Mo one half pose for martial arts. Uh, to give Steven some space with Centipedal because it seems to be scared of the Crystal Gems. Uh, and we enter a little scene where Steven uses potato chips to help train Centipedal uh, be calm and like Steven. This all comes to a head where a seagull uh, attacks Steven for the potato chips and then Centipedal wants to defend Steven, I think, uh, and spits acid at the seagull, scaring it away. When Steven goes, you protected me, <laughs> in his mock Pokemon battle, which is appropriate considering the centipedal's uh, eyeball mouth head thing, which looks like a Pokeball. It does, yes. Uh, Steven even comments that he doesn't know how centipedal eats when its eye is in its mouth. Uh, but Steven is so happy with Centipedal that he brings it into the house, starts squawking to imitate the seagull, and make the Centipedal start spewing acid on multiple objects in the room, such as uh, 
a wooden post, a picture of Pearl, which as it melts seems to have a <laughs> scowl form on it before it disappears, and Amethyst sa Sandwich, which she then confirms that she can speak Spanish, I believe. Yes, she says, no, me torta! <laughs> which is no, my sandwich, but that's obvious, I imagine. <laughs> Who knows? Pearl, uh, uh, once again saying that they shouldn't let her around and they should get back to what they were fighting the original monster for was to get the shooting star of the mountain. But they don't know how to get past the ice boulders blocking the way. Uh, and a nice thoughtful moment from Garnet, she looks at Centipedal and goes, that's how we'll get through. Um, and we cut we cut to the mountain and they go through it where a bunch of obstacles are in their way and Pearl tries to go through it multiple times but Centipedal just shoots acid at the ice and it just instantly melts. Yeah, Pearl, there isn't really much uh, to that other than making Pearl the butt of the joke, which is always appreciated in my eyes. Yay, thumbs up. She could stand to be a little bit more comedic. <laughs> Indeed. Uh... This is when they come to the uh, shooting star held in a little pond or the, the cavern that's containing it. And Pearl says that it's so, oh yes, it's far too hot to touch with bare skin and that Garnet should hold it with her gauntlets. But due to the fact that earlier in the episode, Garnet attacked Centipedal, Centipedal sees the gauntlets and starts freaking out, spewing acid everywhere. Uh, it leads to the cavern starting to cave in a little, and the crystal gems retaliate by fighting Centipedal, much to Stephen's dismay. Because after all that, Stephen trying to uh, help and train Centipedal a whole day of training an animal, which goes so well in the real world, um, <laughs> uh, Stephen tearfully comes to Centipedal trying to remind them of the good times that they had together and hugs Centipedal. Uh, which does actually manage to uh, calm Centipedal down. Um, at that time, though, a stalag stalactite breaks from the yep. ceiling and is about to fall on Stephen, but Centipedal, in the last moment of coherency, pushes Stephen out of the way uh, to save Stephen from getting crushed. Uh, but we end this episode say, with Stephen saying that he wants, he wishes he could help more. Uh, and Garnet reveals that Rose actually, in the past, attempted to heal these monsters, but could never manage it, no matter how hard she tried. Um, and they reassure Stephen by saying that as time goes on, maybe Stephen will find ways to heal them that not even Rose could manage. Um, and Stephen, confident that he can maybe keep things going, uh, bubbles a gem for the first time, uh, to the other crystal gem shock and sends Centipedal back to the burning room where he says that he'll make sure to heal Centipedal back one day. And as the finishing shot of the episode, Steven sends the bag of chips that he was using uh, to Centipedal. And two little star wipes uh, uh, pop off with both as the last thing we see. So those mm -hmm. chips are going to rot like mad, right? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> it will be so bad. There will be new centipedes evolving out of whatever comes out of that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, yes, this episode, I appreciated the continuity between the first episode. This is obviously bringing back the monster from the first episode in order to explore more of its story i suppose is okay. psychology because you can kind of sense that something deeper is going under the surface uh, because we're moving past the point of the crystal monsters being merely sort of fodder for the crystal gems to fight in different episodes and we try to explore what they actually are just a tiny bit more we don't get much of their origin or anything but like that but we do show that there is hope of rehabilitation in the future for them. 
uh, through Stephen's actions. It is implied that that is going to be one of the roots the series will be heavily looking at when it comes to these gem monsters. Indeed. You know, interesting, despite writing so many notes, I don't know if I have much more to say about the episode because it did convey what it was doing well and talking more about it would be more spoilers. But I will say that in the reforming of Centipedal, we do see much like how Pearl regenerated, that it went through multiple forms. And we do see that the very first form it had seemed to be much more humanoid than the later forms that it had. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. If that isn't a giveaway that these monsters used to be gems. Well, they are still gems, <laughs> since they poop but into they them. But they used to be, like, gem people. Oh, no. Know? Now all the people who are watching us while they were watching side by side have been spoiled. Much like that I bag of chips. <laughs> I don't think that's really no, a spoiler. I was doing it's... a chip joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. I don't think that was really a spoiler. I think that was kind of obvious. <laughs> this is fair. They are very obviously working on the same mechanics. Yeah, it's kind of clear that while we don't know what happened and we don't have any knowledge of why it happened. We don't have any context. Something happened. Indeed. Also in the fight scene, very, very near the end of the episode where they were trying to attack the centipedal, I don't feel that it was choreographed as well as it could have been because the crystal gems were at their clumsiest for no particular reason. Huh. They just couldn't handle that Pokeball gem swag that Centipedal had. <laughs> this is a problem that the series has with Pearl, Garnet, and Amethyst. They're only competent when they need, when the plot needs to move, and they're incompetent when the plot needs to halt. Like, their, co their competency is entirely dependent upon what the plot needs, and sometimes the writing for these three characters in particular can be extremely contrived. Hmm. I suppose this is a problem of writing three supposedly competent characters uh, to always be secondary characters in most episodes involving them. Uh, I don't know if... I think it's fair to mention this by now, but every episode has been from Steven's perspective, which does make sense, but I don't think we've even had a single cutaway perspective shot of a character who isn't Steven. Would you say that, Alex? This will never happen. <laughs> it is an interesting artistic choice, and by that I mean... The network. Oh, did Cartoon Network enforce this, or was this from... Here's the thing. The crystal gems are all woman coded, right? And Steven is like basically the only central male in the entire series. This is like, correct. You and I, y'all and I, we are all aware here that Cartoon Network is a really sexist um, network. They canceled Young Justice a long time ago because it had a large female audience, remember? Indeed. Like, I can only imagine that the Steven only perspective, something that fans did complain about, was a rigid mandate by the network in order to appeal to men. Studios are so bizarre. And by bizarre, I mean sexist, but yes. And because of this Steven only perspective, like it comes at the direct expense of the main three crystal gems, which is so, so depressing. Indeed. It They're even... never consistently written too, and it's and it's so obvious upon rewatch that they they basically are only allowed to function as the plot needs them to. Like it makes these stories come off as extremely artificial. It is the inherent reason why writing from one POV can be 
inhibiting in the long run because characters' perspectives are rarely allowed to be explored from a sense that they are the ones experiencing it, unless it's being... We will get into it as it goes on, but I am merely commenting on this uh, uh, because I do not have much more to say about this episode, if I must be perfectly honest. Well, I think I have something to say. Uh, the Crystal Gems basically seem to only be there to prop up Steven. Like, it's yes this is a, this is one of the main problems when writing that one pov is that every character has to always be propping up the pov character because that's the inherent logic of writing this kind of perspective is that's the best way to put it yeah indeed and this is why personally as a writer i would recommend not doing this a hundred percent. Our my, it, it our was problem... a very self destructive writing decision for Stephen only perspective to be the only writing um, perspective that we get of these characters. Yes, it's like I said again. It 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 will it will get more notable as time goes on but it is a nearly a writing piece of advice that it is it is good to have plots where a, a character who is not the main main character is the main perspective focus because steven is really the only one learning things the crystal gems uh, because they are never allowed to be the perspective character to have that problem where they don't really have they're ostensibly all static characters, except for Steven, who's the only dynamic character of the bunch. Yes, and I would make the argument that that is not inherently bad, but uh, if a series goes on for long, it can result in tedium, especially in a series like Steven Universe, which is very much about relationships uh, and many things of that nature, as we see with Centipedo and the like. But it's also really ironic because as a series that gets like touted and critically praised by feminists, none of them really seem to acknowledge the underlying sexism, the very strong underlying sexism and overtones of that sexism that this series does nothing about. I suppose I do not know if they could have done anything considering Cartoon Network. <laughs> Oh, I'm I'm more talking about fan discussions. Like I oh, I, I, I need to true. come with a big disclaimer here. I don't see this as a fault of the writing staff or the production. They were simply trying to do the best with the guidelines that they were given. I just think a lot of Steven Universe fans don't tend to look at Steven Universe with a critical eye when it desperately needs it. Like, a lot of the problems that the later series has really do start in season one, and they only get worse and worse because nobody wanted to criticize Steven Universe because everybody was just happy that it came off as a breath of fresh air, despite the fact that it never really was. Everybody wanted a show that didn't really... Everybody was watching and engaging with a show that didn't actually exist. I do wonder if people's dissatisfaction with Steven Universe as time went on was partially because of this, but I will I will uh, return to this as we go further into the series because I am only recalling this as a someone who did keep up with Steven Universe at a time. There was sort of a not outright frustration, but more kind of sad that there were less chances to see a character's perspective. I think there were times with uh, a character that we will be uh, probably talking about a lot who gets the closest to it, and that makes her one of her, our more favorite characters as a result, but it feels like we don't get a lot of close relationships that would be fine to show without Steven's perspective on everything. It's it's again, this writing trope can work. It's just, it has its downsides and needs to be accommodated for. And we are merely pointing it out because it's slowly becoming noticeable 
due to the frequency of it. And it still makes sense in the context of season one, but it, it is merely something to note that the Crystal Gems as characters haven't really budged as characters, and we're 23 episodes in. Yeah, they're basically just wingmen for Steven. It is something to discuss as time goes on. Do you have anything else to say, Alex? Like, the crystal gems are all very realistically flawed, and I think that's good, but the problem we is, don't is see that episodes. the incompetency of their characters isn't really balanced out with the characters. Like, like, this is one of the most contrived plots we've ever seen, and it kind of makes... Like, this This is probably the one first notable instance of Steven needing to save the Crystal Gems all because they were, quote-unquote, a little bit clumsy when this has never happened before. Not that it can't happen, but it's just... it. The writing does not complement what the series is trying to betray in these moments. It's so contrived. I almost wondered if only one of them should have been on the trip to the mountain, but it would have made slightly more sense. But uh, it yeah, makes again. them all look really bad, and you don't want your three leading women to all be this incompetent. Like, they have faced much more dangerous situations, and I'm not saying that they can't fail every now and then, but this is like the most openly like buffoonish garnet <laughs> amethyst and pearl have been they were absolute buffoons <laughs> tripping down the stairs and like a banana peel and a clown pie at the bottom of the stairs that is life and steven the man of the group had to save them like that's an unavoidably sexist thing no matter which way you look at it it is yes it it is a problem it will we will keep commenting it as it goes on i i guess the main thing of note here is that <laughs> while while we love steven universe it it's weird because i did i i did like this episode over the grand scheme of things even though we're being so critical of it uh, i did genuinely like this episode and, and what it was trying to do about the hope of rehabilitation but I guess what we're speaking about is the itch that is starting to form of going like, so when are we going to get like an actual episode led by a crystal gem? And the answer will technically it will happen, but also never. <laughs> it is Let's a, just rip the bandaid off. It's never going to happen. It is unfortunate. I, th I think that is something I, I wished would have would have happened with steven universe is you need to temper your expectations with steven universe because there are places where it does not deliver where it seems like it will and the crystal gems existing having real lives outside of steven is never going to happen because they only exist for steven and that in and out of itself is a sexist writing decision intentional or not but yes, uh, uh, interesting how we got uh, this critical for this episode, but I, I do believe that is everything I I have. really didn't want to, but this is the first extremely contrived instance of it. So I, I just felt that I had to say something. No, it is okay. You did mention that from our comments uh, last episode, how the crystal gem technology and artifacts and other such qualities uh, were contrived in the sense that they were created to help contextualize the plot of the episode. The shooting star is truly uh, in this episode. I think it is fair to call it a contrived magical artifact because I am not sure what it is actually. In fact, I think it is a joke that Steven doesn't even know what they're getting it for. And Amethyst says like, well, duh, you shoot it. And that was it. I don't think we have an actual explanation for what it is supposed to do. So it is, it is <laughs> a very MacGuffin it's, item. It's most likely a weapon that they wanted to retrieve. That is true. This Amethyst, I do know why she would respond that way. Uh, while it, while I do, there are multiple ways that you can take that joke, and I do believe your reading is correct. 
but I also think this reading is correct. It does contextualize how foreign of a culture that gems, the gems culture is from human culture that Amethyst can very easily identify what it's for. It's implied to be a weapon, but Stephen, because he is unfamiliar with the culture, doesn't really get the sociological circumstances of what Amethyst is saying. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a joke that works on a lot of levels, and it's probably the smartest joke in the episode. Well, yes, it was, it was not a bad joke. I, I was merely commenting on the. Uh... Oh no! Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I think that is it. <laughs> really downtown, but I am happy to record another episode. All right. Good night, everybody. As usual, I am Transpanda Olive Fronting. You can find us at Transpanda1 on Tumblr or Transpanda Art on Twitter and Tumblr. Uh, and this is Alex. Good night, everyone. Please support our Patreon. Thank you for existing. Bye. If I could begin to be half of what you think of me, I could do about anything. I could even learn how to love like you.